Derivatives trading involves substantial risk of loss and is not suitable for all investors. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. So stressful. When the world's on fire. Good God. I can't look at this, guys. Like, my strategy is you buy it and you hope that you gotta get spot. Yeah, but we all think you're crazy. You don't fight this. No way. The markets are freaking out and you don't think that anything is wrong? Come back tomorrow and I'll lose it all. It should be fun. Good morning, everybody. I'm, I'm going for the dramatic lighting today. No, I'm just kidding. It's, the light's not turning out. Okay, there we go. So, oh yeah, and we also we need music. Yesterday, we had a pretty major shift in the treasury market, but they have given up a lot of those gains this morning. We don't have a whole lot of news, and, and the big question is going to be, do we see some of this weakness follow through into the services PMI and the jobs numbers? And if they do, then we really could see the market shift in a major way towards a risk-off environment where they're expecting a recession. So that's what I'm looking at right now. Let's come over to the charts. <clears throat> if I can find the right one. Okay, so so here you have the treasuries, right? You got a pretty decent uptrend forming here, and they're going into levels that are quite quite up there, right? But you can see, yeah, beating back here today. S and P five hundred on in the meantime continues to be okay. So like the action. Yesterday didn't look too, you know, they, they got pummeled, but then late rally overnight, another rally. So, and then you got oil, oil continuing to trudge upwards. Market's very concerned about that. Gold and silver holding their own and copper, copper a little bit to the downside. So, so while we've got commodities moving up, gold and silver and copper, right? doing oh well okay we got the commodities moving up but copper not doing so well so i, I think that kind of signals the stagflationary environment right one where inflation remains high but global growth is not good okay here's bitcoin kind of trudging along there was some um major well there was a headline about a red notice being put out on the founder of binance but i'm not sure if i believe that headline and then you got the dollar having like huge shifts yesterday. Big up, big down. So today, um, maybe a slightly quieter day because the only major news that we have, well, we have factory orders, factory orders and jolts at 10 o'clock. U.S. core durable goods. So, so that's not necessarily a huge piece of news, right? Also, um, we got Fed's Cook speaking at 11.30, but they, she already spoke yesterday. And this one is just like opening remarks at a conference through video. So I don't expect that one to be very big. Bank of England's pill. Um, I don't know, but that's that's going to be pretty late into our session. So so I'm looking at a little bit more of a range bound day. I'm going to see. I have the position that I, we had in the the sim yesterday. So um, I'm just going to leave that alone over here with us below 4.5. I might be on the lookout for a, uh, well, let's, let's just see what happens. I, I think we need to be on the lookout for a trade, right? All right. Let me blow my nose here. <clears throat> Well, I think um, I think I'm at least getting. No, I'm not as sick. I think that's good. CD Rob saying, "Hurry!" I I was very late today, wasn't I? You know what happened was I I have um I like to eat still cut oats, and so my wife couldn't find them at the grocery store, so she bought a different type of still cut oats. So I tried them. 
and uh, like they didn't work. I like it. the bowl that I had was way too small. And um, so I had to find other stuff to eat, and that's why it was a little bit late. I mean, I've been late a lot lately, but later than usual. Let's come here into Twitter, see what we get. Oh, do we have election in Chicago today? <laughs> Is um, Bitfinex complaining about Coindesk reporting on Bitcoin trading volumes because they don't really mean anything. He's totally right. <laughs> Mohammed L. Ellerian on mounting credibility problems at the Federal Reserve. There are good reasons to be concerned. In just the last three years, the Fed has mishandled its interest rate hiking cycle, faced insider trading allegations, stumbled in its supervision of bank, and through inconsistent communication, fueled rather than calmed market volatility on several... Whoa, it was not the Fed that caused that. That was yelling. These failings are becoming increasingly consequential for the public. The inflation has remained too high for too long, robbing people of purchasing power and hitting the poor particularly hard. Last month's bank collapses were deemed serious enough by the authorities to break the class, class by triggering systemic risk exception, but this response could now impose a larger burden on all depositors. These developments, including the threat of less credit availability, have increased the risk of the U.S. falling into a recession, fueling income insecurity in what would otherwise be considered a strong economy. You know, I it's, it is so weird to think about that we really have had a strong economy. It's, it's taken hit after hit after hit and continues to trudge on. But it really doesn't feel strong, does it? It feels like, I mean, the stock market has just been dismal. That's why. I guess the stock market is not the economy, right? But that just kind of shows you where we're at. There's not a whole lot overnight. Let's see what the treasuries do here. I I am kind of leaning towards that they go higher again, but really uncertain today. Do we have auctions today? Mm, don't think we do. Mm, we really don't have a whole lot to go off of today other than yesterday's action. I don't know if that's enough. Because the thing was, is that like we did move up significantly, but it was pretty much all happened around the news. And then after that, it was pretty tight. So, and it's looking really tight this morning too. One little hair on my mustache that's too long. I'm trying to guide a different direction. <clears throat> well, you know... It's not just the treasuries that are quiet. The whole market is quiet this morning. 
So. You know what's on my mind? I uh, see. I continue to see uh, Democrats push the narrative that the only reason we have inflation is because of quote corporate greed. And I've always said, well, like dead companies suddenly become more greedy. No, it, it's really it's corporations have always been greedy. And have always wanted to take as much money as they can. And the situation just turned into one where they're able to profit from it. So they did. Right? It was it was giving the people the money allowed for uh, corporations to benefit. And, and I kind of wonder, what else did Democrats really think would happen? Because I was watching another video where it was it was uh, the the guy that created the Young Turks going up against Ben Shapiro, and and he was basically arguing that Keynesian economics was more effective, and and he was arguing specifically that uh, demand side stimulus was more effective than supply side that you shouldn't do supply side stimulus at all. You should just do demand side stimulus, right? And he was he was arguing like, well, the reason that you do that kind of stimulus is because when you give the money to the middle class, they actually spend it. Right? So if that's what your policy is, what else would you expect that other than companies to make more profits? Like, it just seems silly to me, right? Oh, well, we're going to give regular people more money because they're going to give that money to the corporations. Who's going to end up with the money? The corporations! It's... Come on! What else could... What else... What other scenario is there? It's so... It's it's so... I, I What are they thinking? I don't, I don't get it. It's like their policy did exactly what it's supposed to, and it sucks, <laughs> right? And uh, they so real like, oh, what? it did exactly what we wanted, but what actually exactly what we wanted kind of sucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it kind of does. Well, the treasury is on. I don't know if I, I can consider any of this movement significant, but it's all we got to go off of. So we're on the downside. Yeah, I'll never forget the TV boxes at the curbs in my neighborhood on the garbage day after we all got our stimulus checks. Totally. People, totally. People totally just went out and bought TVs. Oops. I wanted to ban this guy, not block it. Let's see here. So this guy used the bit.ly link. And I dumped all of my stimulus money in. Ex yeah. I don't I didn't dump all of it. I actually I, I you know what? It worked out way better than I thought it would. I I saved a lot of it in the bank account and then used it when the prices went up and my wife wasn't working. So I saved it, but not all in the market. But, you know, if you put it all in the market, you're probably down, right? When you start thinking about that, though, it, it really helps to highlight one of the major differences between, well, if you put it in really, really early, then maybe you are up, yeah. Um, 
But uh, one of the really big differences between supply side and demand side stimulus, right? Supply side stimulus is an investment and that investment can take a long time to come to fruition sometimes, right? See, it it's just like almost everything else that I see with the Democrat party, which is that they're only thinking about short-term stuff, right? It's all, I want what I want now, give me my thing now. It's, it's all short-term thinking. You need to have supply and demand side stimulus because at, in the future, you, you need to be able to support higher demand without prices going up. So you need to s support the, the supply side as well. But the supply, yeah, I mean, there are some things that you can do that are like, quote, shovel ready and stuff like that, but that, that's not everything. And, and some of your investments take years to come to fruition. Oh, because you got in on oil. <laughs> That's funny. <clears throat> you know, the, the whole oil trade, you know what? Uh, the oil thing is funny to me, too. I'm, I'm on a like a big anti-Democrat rant today is what it because it just keeps coming into. Here's a problem with Democrats. Here's a problem with Democrats. OK, so here's a problem with Democrats. Saudis come in and lower OPEC output by 1.5 million barrels per day. And every Democrat is out there with their hair on fire. Well, this certainly doesn't help our economic recovery. This certainly doesn't help inflation, makes the Federal Reserve's job more difficult, et cetera, et cetera. Why are you out there like making it worse? <laughs> why, why are you out there making it worse? But then when you look at it, okay, so oil was moving up. We saw that move coming, we were a little bit early. Kind of got a little bit burned and then made money on the other side of it. Um, but then after the initial parts of the Ukraine war, prices settled back down. And they settled back down to like $70 a barrel, which isn't terrible. That's back to like where prices were to begin with. So if OPEC oil policy was so absolutely terrible... Right. Why is it that prices only, you know, got all the way back to 70? Right. They, they, shouldn't they have stayed above $100 a barrel? You know? And then there's this latest one. Well, it's up, it's from 70 to 80. I'm not sure how much higher that can go. I haven't seen any analyst reports on on what they think from from a fundamental perspective what that should be now, right? But like if we're going into a recession, which from from the manufacturing side, it seems like we definitely are already in a recession and, and in the early stages of it, right? If, if that's what's happening, then shouldn't they reduce oil output? Unless you, want, you really want oil prices to just absolutely crash, <laughs> right? The green revolution is just government sending shitloads of money to utilities. I, it, it bothers me so much that it's like, if it is so effective, why does it require government stimulus to get off the ground? Right? So like, if we're talking about supply side stimulus, we're, we're talking about businesses that are already making money and are successful and we're just helping them grow faster, right? That, that would be kind of the, you wouldn't want to put it into companies that like are unproven per se. But it seems like most of the green energy stuff that they put money into is is like that. It's, it's, it's investment that very often just goes down the drain. Yeah, put, put, putting solar panels on your roof that connect to the grid is just you being a solar node for the utility company. Yeah. Because <laughs> you don't really, I mean, uh, so where it depends on where you live a little bit, right? Where I live, um, it's, it's taken out against your um, utility bill. And if you generate more power than you use, then the utility company actually pays you back. 
Now, you probably still have to use power from them, so you probably still owe money, but theoretically, it's possible that the power company pays you every month. But it's not like that everywhere. At the same time, the the subsidy that you get if you put put them on your roof is crazy. Depends on whether or not you have on-site storage. Well, that's no, that's different though too, right? Because if you produce more than you make and you put it on and then it goes into your storage then you just use your storage right now different different states have different rules De or or rather actually it depends on your power company because there there are some areas in utah where it's different like they're like so so where i live um, most of us are on Rocky Mountain Rocky Mountain power and and they do that thing where um, the excess power that you produce if you don't have any high on-site storage by the way excess power that you produce um, reduces your power bill but if you live over in Bountiful which doesn't have any of that stuff um because they have their own local power company then it's like almost you don't see very many people over there get solar panels oh if if the power goes out in the neighborhood and we're both standing outside without power probably yes unless unless you have on yeah my parents they did that and they got the on-site power banks and it was a pretty ridiculous amount to to get the on-site power banks and everything but they have a massive solar panel because they have a hill they have a hill and so they were able to just put put it on on the hill so they're in a special situation. I always get the guys, they want to come over to my house and do it. And it's like, dude, there's not enough. There's not enough coverage on my roof for it to, to pay me back. Doesn't make any sense. Now, well, so I think my parents, even if they didn't have the on-site storage, that it would probably pay for itself over a... 15 year period but 15 years is a long time but but the real issue here is is that like all of this money is going into this unproven technology that has really serious issues and can't completely solve our problems and and meanwhile there's like technology that's ready to go and can sol solve our needs and they refuse to give them the money because the left is still traumatized from Three Mile Island. <laughs> oh, man. You're gonna finance a $50,000 system in punch holes and a perfectly good roof to save the same amount of money on your power bill that you could save by unplugging your phone charger? Oh, it's, it's more than that. It's more than that, but it's, I mean, if we're saying, if I, I said 15 years, right? So you got $50,000 minus the $15,000 credit divided by 15 years divided by 12 months a year. No, that wouldn't be it. You wouldn't sell it because you're not making 194 a month from it. No, sir. So it would take longer than that. It'd have to be longer than that. I 
maybe over 30 years. Nah, I think that my parents save like $20 a month or something like that. It's not that much. Actually, for a time, you know what he was doing for a time was he was mining he was mining Bitcoin with an ant miner. And the uh and then then they were neutral. Then they were neutral on the grid. But uh my mom made him get rid of it because it was too loud. <laughs> Keep your AC off when no one's home. You must live in Florida, huh? That's... <laughs> I, 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 it was something that always weirded me out. Like when I went to Missouri, most people there did not have AC units. Even in the new homes, they didn't necessarily have AC units. Here in Utah, man, everybody has an AC unit. It's you you have to get out into the really old neighborhoods before you get to places where they don't have an air conditioner my uh my wife's house you know that we lived in for like a year before we moved was ha had a swamp cooler and i couldn't stand it <laughs> couldn't stand it and, and here in Utah, there's no way you would, like, leave the AC off when you're gone. No way. Unless you were, like, unless you were gone all day. My mom has a swamp cooler, too. It's gas. So, you know what happened with our swamp cooler? Was when we were putting it together, when we were fixing it. Uh, not fixing it. When we were, like, winterizing it. Right? We were winterizing it. Um something didn't get connected back up correctly and there was a leak and then it like the the ceiling in two rooms collapsed <laughs> why on earth did it well before before ac became a popular thing in the the 90s 80s 90s back in the 70s it was like now i i have an outside swamp cooler for my garage i have a swamp cooler for my garage when i'm working out and i really like that thing i really like that thing but here in utah man like like you would have to be gone until like nine o'clock at night for for it to make any sense to turn your ac off man no way no way you do that because it stays it stays hot late into the night right you wouldn't you wouldn't be able you wouldn't get any cold air until you were going to sleep. Hmm, the current banker crisis is not over yet. Jamie Dimon warns of repercussions for years to come. A well-programmed thermostat saves that. That's true. Probably saves more money than the twenty dollars or whatever that you're getting from your tiny solar panels. Yeah, yeah. It drives me crazy because you get a fifteen thousand dollar credit. You do. You get a fifteen thousand dollar credit on your taxes. You still have to pay for it, but then you get fifteen thousand dollars back, right? And the solar panel salesmen are are out there all the time. Somebody I don't know comes to my door. I know it's a solar panel salesman. I'm like, I'm not interested in buying solar panels. Oh, how did you know that I was up trying to get you to buy solar? Like nobody on nobody in the neighborhood does because nobody has a, a, a can, you know, the roofs are all like segmented and stuff like that. So like there's just not enough space on your roofs to, to get enough panels for it to even make it even with the credit to make economic sense. Right. <clears throat> it's just like everything else right we as people want to think that we're making decisions based on rational information but that's not the way that most people's brains work 
most most people um for whatever emotional reason uh, want to believe a certain thing and then they look for information to confirm their bias so the left they don't like nuclear power and and they do all sorts of <laughs> twisting their brains in a knot because they, they don't want to accept that nuclear power is a more effective solution. And the one the one place I don't even think that it would be like that I'm I'm immune to that effect either. I maybe I'm slightly more likely to 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 push against that sort of a thing. But like here in trading, I think I pushed against it for a long time, right? It's it's just that if you're trading you you basically have you come down to a point where you have kind of you know you have to acknowledge the reality right that certain certain things just aren't very effective looks like it's going to be a choppy downward day well i'm uncertain which direction the treasuries are really going to go today if they move at all but it is really is quite dead isn't it it really is quite dead today I should change the stream name to go away. This is the most boring trading day ever. <laughs> well, it could be worse. It's only been 30 minutes, right? And you never know. We we should stay vigilant. We want to be like some of these days where like then then the big move happens and we're not we're not on top of it at all. By the way, I should know. Relatively significant selling in the five year through this range. So it seems like there is something going on. <laughs> Trump attorney announces plans to file motions to dismiss alleging prosecutorial misconduct. Oh, wow. Mohammed L. Arian doesn't like the Federal Reserve's policy. I'm surprised. What, what did he say exactly? Mm. I'm not going to read this whole article. It's too long. kind of looking around here oil does appear to be moving on the upside i guess if you if you really had to trade today i would probably prefer to be in oil huh after i got my roof done solar company called me every day for a week i heard you got a new roof that needs that ha needs some holes <laughs> oh when you got your roof done that's interesting I mean, it's so so. Here's another thing that drives me crazy about it. Okay, is that solar panels don't give you the power when it's needed, right? Like people use power at night, and especially you get in all of these electric vehicles. You're charging all your cars at night. You're gonna need the power at night, and you're relying on solar. Guess what? You're not gonna have it. Wind inconsistent. Solar, both solar and wind. It's it's not like it's like a bat like. We shouldn't invest at all in those technologies. It's just those are supplementary technologies. They can't solve the core problem.
a hard, hard push for that is why I filed into oil companies. Well, I don't, I don't understand how the hard push for that made it more likely for oil to go up. I think that the reality was that su supply in oil companies had been destroyed by Biden's policies. Like they were already kind of hurting and the pandemic. Sorry, I kind of got things out of sequence here, right? The pandemic really hurt oil supply, right? Like everything kind of shut down. And then when they're trying to recover, the Biden administration puts in all of these restrictions and kind of stops them from ramping back up. And then at the same time, they're pissing the Saudis off. Yeah, they're going to. It's going to result in higher oil prices. That doesn't win promising to end. I, I Well, how much does promising to end fossil fuels really who people though i i wonder how how like like that's the thing is that um from the 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 polls and everything that i've seen uh energy is not very high up on very many people's list all right i guess that's the best opportunity i'm gonna get i'm gonna go for it here yeah, uh, but I, I, I don't think that the larger public really cares about the issue very much, right? Like if we go for um, public polling issue engagement or something like that, um, ah, the most important problem, Gallup historical trends. So like right now, high cost of living, economy in general, federal budget, gap between rich and poor, unemployment, wages, lack of money, taxes, and then all the way down here, fuel and oil prices. Right. Well, there are some points where it kind of rises and it becomes the number four issue and then it fades again, right? So I'm I'm just saying I I don't think that politicians actually get that much of a boost from pushing this stuff. They get kickbacks might be because of that. They get kickbacks. Sorry, where was that order at? Oh, four. Cool. No, well, uh, so so people might think that that they're going to save that the politician is going to save the planet from imminent catastrophe. But I, I, I don't think that the saying that gives a politician enough of a boost to uh, explain the amount of investment they put into it. Okay. Um, I think that one, they get pretty big kickbacks from doing it, right? They're giving all of their buddies money. And two, I think they genuinely believe it. I think that they've they've genu genuinely fallen into a, a hysteria that tells them that the world is gonna end in 10 years. Right. Which, which, look, the science doesn't support. <laughs> That's the other thing that I think is funny is that is that they don't actually believe their own science. Like, <laughs> if you if you go in and you show them the actual science and you show them, well, okay. After a hundred years, the effect of global warming is this, and and you show them what the science says the actual effects are. It's not the end of the world, okay? It is, it is a a pretty serious issue across the world, but it's 
it not it's not like everybody is going to be dying like they're saying like like they put off because because the way that that greta thornburg plate puts it is the humanity humankind is going to be extinct in a hundred years that uh we're all going to be underwater this sort of a thing right and, and that's not what the science says in, in fact the, the science kind of suggests that if the sea rises it'll be like a meter if that if it rises at all why did it go long um i'm just i'm just trying to manage this position here um i'm i'm maybe i should bail on it because after i did that we got a pretty aggressive slip there didn't we what's a primary reason you well so the 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 play right now is that the date the economic data is going to suggest that we're moving into a recession so we got that yesterday and i think tomorrow when we get the service pmis we're going to see more of the same and so by the end of the week we could see interest rates a little bit lower um so i'm kind of trying to manage this position here it's long from an average of 09 break even at 040 when it came in there, I added another contract because that was had been the low end of the range. But that next move has come against me. So now the question is, do you puke the contract or do you, do you just keep doubling down? It's been so quiet today, and I really don't see a reason for the treasury market to be really strongly pushing in a direction. There was selling in the 30 year. I don't know. I'm going to try and hang on. It is just a sim. I'm trying to take it seriously because this is like, how how would you... I'm trying to explore how I would manage a position, a swing position for like a long short equity fund. So that's, that's the... So understand that that's quite a different entry from if I take an entry over here in the micro yields, right? I believe in global cooling. How many contracts can you trade in the 10 year? Well, I have seen situations where, okay. So like right now you can see in the micro 10 year, they're, they're bidding 522. Um, if you really wanted to trade 522, I think they would accommodate you. You, you can do quite a lot. Uh, or rather, I think that you can do enough contracts to, to use whatever margin would be reasonable for you to use as a retail trader. Obviously, if you needed to, if you needed to buy like $10 million worth of bond futures, then, then you would be in a problem, right? <laughs> then you'd be in a pinch. the next ice age is coming i the there's like here's the thing i'm not an expert on global warming right i i am i am an amateur at data science and one of the things that i know from data science is that somebody coming in and saying our model shows that over the next hundred years blah 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 like it's it's probably not going to play out exactly like that <laughs> right all all models are wrong some are useful right and this this uh narrative that i constantly see in the media that like scientists have predict know what's going to happen to the temperature over the next hundred years and it's all been it's you know they know for sure is just so ridiculous to me that's not science like like what i continually see over and like part of the reason why i would say i'm not an expert in global warming is because um i'm not gonna go and like read hundreds of studies on this 
but what I do see presented in the media is always uh, presented incorrectly. Like it's, you know, like I said, you you go in and you, you do some research about how much is the sea level predicted to rise and look at the studies for that, right? And it says it's about a meter. And then you got guys like Al Gore saying like, we're all gonna be underwater in five to 10 years. It's ridiculous, right? Like, where is he getting that prediction from? Because it doesn't line up with any of the peer-reviewed science. And then, and then on top of that, they're always constantly trying to make every little thing that happens with the weather about global warming, when usually it's not related to that at all. And um, I, I do believe that Brad is correct in that um, based on the way that the weather cycles go, we have probably just been at the end of a warming cycle and are likely going into a little bit of a cooling cycle, which, which isn't to say that it would be like a significant thing, but that we're more likely to start having cold winters like we had in the 80s. We're, we're like my understanding is that we're likely to start going back into uh the the cold winters like the 80s and that's what i i read last summer and then this winter it definitely played out that way at least so Well, I'll tell you what, I, I was sure feeling nervous there, but they have come back up to 04 and it's it's hard not to see all of that action that we saw there is is just kind of a blip or noise with the market maker trying to screw you over and not really anything significant. Since interest rates don't change intraday, well, they do. Are the price fluctuations in the micro yields reflecting interest rate projections or do interest rates change intraday? Okay, so. It, it, you have to, it, it comes down to terminology here. Okay. So when you say the interest rate doesn't change, um, that's incorrect. Okay, the coupon doesn't change. Okay, so so the coupon is um, when the when the treasury is auctioned off, there's a coupon rate that gets set, right? And it says you make um, two percent per year. Okay, so so if you buy a hundred thousand dollar bond and the coupon rate that you got on it was two, then every six months you're going to get a thousand dollar payment right that's the coupon okay from from there that bond trades in the open market so the price of the bond fluctuates but the coupon doesn't fluctuate right so um if you hold and and you got to remember that you're giving them a hundred thousand dollars at the end at when it, the treasury expires you're going to get a hundred thousand dollars back right you're going to get the par value back at the end okay so it might be trading less than par right now but then in 10 years you are going to get a hundred dollars back right so you can kind of calculate what the expected return is on that right and and it's going to come out to the interest rate that it's trading right and so that's where that comes from is they're they're pricing the the bond based on what the coupon rate is relative to what interest rates are today for bond for bonds that are being issued today right and then you know you can do all of this math to, to sort out what your actual interest rate is on on that instrument and that's the rate that we're looking at right so the way that they get this 
the way that they get this number is um, over in uh, Broker Tech, which is an exchange run by the CME. Um, there are people putting bids and offers out for bonds, for cash bonds, for 10-year cash bonds. And they, they look at the bids and offers and the prices that they're paying for that. And they calculate what the interest rate is for that best bid and best offer. And that becomes the index that the micro treasury yield futures settle against. So that's how you get it. So the price fluctuation in the micro yields are reflecting the actual interest rate that the treasuries are going for in the cash market. It's a derivative, but it's, it's cash settled, but that's, that's how it works, right? So, um, but you can kind of say interest rate projections, it kind of is. The, the, the market is kind of projecting things out. So one of the things that you can get is forwards, for instance. So a, a forward is um, basically a contract for a treasury that hasn't been issued yet, right? And so um, you're saying by the time this treasury does get issued, this is what the interest rate is going to be. And then there's a little bit of premium added on top of that for the risk of holding that and, you know, the transaction costs of it and everything, right? We find that, that forwards tend to overestimate how much it's going to change in, until the forward comes due, okay? That, but, but those are kind of forwards, right? So you can, you can like create a forward yield curve, you can create a regular, you know, and then you can extend that into just our regular yield curve, right? So to some extent, the yield curve is trying to predict what interest rates are going to be because the market is saying, well, if you buy a, a bill right now, you're going to be getting 5%. But um, if you're buying a 10 year treasury in 10 years, the interest rate is probably not going to be that it's probably going to be a little bit lower. And so they're giving you 3.5. And that's why the 10 year is, is lower and you get like an inverted yield curve, right? Because the market is, is, predicting that the interest rates are going to go lower in the next 10 years. Right? So um, that's how the yield curve can in some ways be a prediction of what is where interest rates are going. Does that answer the question? How would all that help us in our trading? Well, because you need to be able to understand what the market is doing, right? So when I said it kind of is, you got to remember that the market is not perfectly efficient, right? And part of what happens is that um, certain institutions prefer to act on certain parts of the curve, right? And so some of the aberrations in the curve, for instance, there's always kind of a kink around the 10 year. Well, that has to do with that certain institutions just prefer to use the tenure. So there tends to be a kink in the curve that you have to account for. And as far as we can tell, that kink is caused by the order flows that come in, right? So once we understand all of those different things, then we can kind of come in and we can analyze the flows that we're actually seeing, right? To, to understand why those flows might come in in a certain way, right? Like if the treasuries are selling, if the interest rates are going up, they're doing that because they're expecting that the economic conditions are such that it's gonna justify higher interest rates, right? So, yeah, if you want a coin flip, then then go for it. But the, the more that you understand about this stuff, the, the, the more flows you're going to be able to both understand and predict, right? So it might, it might seem like irrelevant, but I promise you at some point it becomes relevant. <laughs> and if you were, if you were going to work for an institution, then it really, then that stuff really becomes relevant because now, because then you're like trying to model the curve 
yourself and make those kinds of estimates. Well, no, because you got to remember, uh, even though that might seem like a high time frame sort of a thing, but it always comes down and plays in the micro, right? You have to understand why do people trade this instrument, right? Why do people buy or sell treasuries, right? So that you can interpret the economic data and the news and everything else into an actual flow. Right. If you don't understand the fundamentals of the instrument, if you don't understand why people buy and sell that particular instrument, then how are you going to make those kinds of predictions about flows? Right. <clears throat> and 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 this goes for any instrument, really. So what what I see very, very frequently in the retail trading community is they they don't really understand why people trade the instrument and so they'll see a piece of news come out and the instrument doesn't go the direction that they think it will and they're like well that doesn't make sense maybe that news doesn't matter because in their mind it's like okay so if the number is good then it should should go up if that was really the correlation then those should always hold good it should always go up bad it should always go down but that's not the way that it works because you have to understand why do people actually trade that instrument? What is the actual situation right now? Are, are, is that change in the data actually going to affect why people are in this thing, right? So the, 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 what I'm trying to say with the, this swing trade that I am in is that the economy appears to be going into a recession and that the economic data is going to look weaker this month. That's that's the view that I'm expressing with that trade, right? And so so I'm saying when the PMIs come in or service PMIs come in lower than expected, people are going to buy treasuries. Now, why is why are they going to do that? Well, because number 1, that means the Federal Reserve isn't going to have to raise interest rates as much right number two um if the economy is going into a recession that's bad for stocks that's going to hurt the earnings of companies so people are going to sell stocks and buy treasuries as a flight to safety right so so now i've identified two mechanisms whereby it could create buying flows right ergo i can take now i know which direction the flows are going to be and that it's going to be a significant amount of flow i can take a position trading that right going long but I, I can't do that without understanding how treasuries work in the first place and the more you understand about them the better able you're going to be able to to make those kinds of calls and predict those flows right? it is complicated stuff but um don't shy away from the complicated stuff guys that's where the money is it was if all you had to do was flip a coin and make money then everybody would do it <laughs> right you're talking about something that the vast majority of people that do it lose money from right so my take on that then is that if you want to have success with it you're gonna have to try and be sophisticated the trick is being able to take that sophisticated framework and turn it into something that is quick and simple when you're when you are executing right so i kind of have already learned all that stuff and i kind of have it all in the back of my head so that when i hear that news hits i know exactly what's going to happen without almost by instinct right And then I can then I can execute it off of instinct at that point. So I've been able. Uh, you're able. That's how you take something that's really complicated and turn it into something that is simple when you're executing. Right. So like when people are asking, well, why did you take a long at L4? Well, 
I want to be long and I'm just trying to manage the trade. So I see it at the bottom of that range. I'm going to add a contract to, to manage and try and um, get my cost basis lower. That's it. But that's a bunch of thinking that I did ahead of time. Uh, all, all I thought of when I actually took the trade was, hey, choppy market, bottom of the range. Seems like I can get filled there. Not too happy with how it turned out, but it's been okay, right? Adding to a loser is not for me. Yeah, I don't know if it's for me either. That's why this is kind of a little bit of an experiment. I wouldn't necessarily call it adding to a loser because there's like a certain amount of risk I'm willing to take on with the trade. And what I'm putting on here is not even close to that maximum amount, right? So in, instead, what I'm seeing it as is um, taking on risk in a low risk location with the hopes of only taking on that risk for a short time to be able to extend the amount of time that I'm able to hold the, the trade. Because because here's the thing, if you ever get big, if you ever get big, you're not going to be able to all in and all out, right? I remember many moons when I explained this to you. Um, okay. I don't know. I don't know if the way that I'm approaching this is going to work out. Yeah, it, well, you can't. Yeah, if you become a big trader, then you can't all in all out. But. Practicing, practicing like adding to a position, you know, like like just say I'm going to add five contracts, but I can't do them all within the same minute or something like that, right? Uh if you do that and you start to look for okay where's the best places for me to get my fills you you will start to think about the sorts of things that the big guys have to consider all right we discussed the difference between adding to a loser and averaging into a predetermined risk parameters and how it gives you a range to build a position instead of an individual price yeah I, I, if we were having that conversation, probably the thing that I was, was complaining about or arguing about was that, uh, that doesn't mean necessarily mean that there is a, an edge in X thing, right? Now, I think that I have an edge or, or at least I thought I had an edge in picking 04 because I thought that the, the flows was suggesting that I could get it. But <laughs> now you just I, I think that you just gotta be careful in thinking that Averaging into a position on its own is an edge. That's that's a deception. Right. Uh, um, there's a reason why you might want to do that. Right. Because I, I want to reduce my adverse excursion. So if it and if I want to hold this for a long time, I'm probably going to get a lot of adverse excursions. So I can kind of take advantage of the oscillations of the market to kind of reduce that risk. Who are the, the participants in micro yields? Is it predominantly retail? So I don't think that we have any stats about that. I would guess that it is probably predominantly retail, but I, I, there does appear to me to be some situations where large, like, like for instance, here at 3.468, 277 contracts traded, right? 
So you think that that was a retail trader? I, I don't know. But you do occasionally see large trades take place over here. And same thing with micro ES. There's, I mean, there's no way for us to really know, right? The, the thing that frustrates me is that you can increase your win rate by taking on more risk. And, and what that tends to mean is that in the short run, you will look better, but it doesn't actually change the long run expectancy of the system. All it does is it changes the kurtosis of the distribution, it makes it so that you win most of the time and then you catch these, catch these really bad losers over here, right? So the idea that the the adding to and, and taking out and the, the, the managing risk section and the um what would we say the, these these sorts of things they, they're not actually I wouldn't actually consider them edge, right? They they ultimately they they don't necessarily change the long run expectancy of the system. But what they can do is they can they can morph the performance of your system that in some instances may be advantageous to you in that situation, right? So if I really want to catch a runner, then having those multiple contracts uh, makes it a lot easier from a mental perspective at the very least to be able to hold that for a long time, right? To be able to hold that for a long time. And that's why we do it. That's why I'm doing it this way, right? But I'm still on top of that. There's a real edge. What is the real edge? The real edge is information that I have that suggests that this is the way that the economic numbers are gonna go things in the order flow that suggest that that's a good location, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Just going for a few ticks with a precise entry is what I'm going for? Well, how precise do you want to be? <laughs> so so, so the, the problem that, that uh, I find we run into when we're trying to, to scalp with precision like that is that the natural oscillations of the market end up being more than the amount of accuracy that you want to have okay so like if you're coming in here on the treasury and and you want to keep your risk to like four ticks which is what i was doing for a really really long time that is so effing hard to do to keep your risk that low like it's really insanely difficult Right. And so the reality is just that just based on random chance you take an order, it could go four ticks against you. Right. So in, in order to uh, make money from a strategy with that tight of a risk parameter, you have to have a very, very strong edge. Right. That when you get in, you need to be expecting flow going your way immediately. Right. So it makes it hard, right? And and the issue is like what what edges do you have as a retail trader that can give you something with that that strong of an edge? You know? Cuz if you look at the way that the market makers do it, right? Well, they're they're only trying to make a tick yes but they're adding and removing contracts all the time right so four ticks against them they're managing that right but if if they had to all in all out it probably wouldn't work for them right they had to all in all out and they could only take four ticks of risk probably wouldn't work out very well for them
So you kind of have to look at they're doing what you're doing uh, just more accurate, more actively and with a lot more contracts. Yeah, well, they're doing it with a lot more contracts. Yes. Um, I would say it's somewhat similar to what I'm doing. Yes. I, I think Akshay disagrees with that, right? But <clears throat> but yeah, uh, in, in general, if your strategy requires a risk parameter that is less than the average swing size of your market, it's going to be very difficult to have success with that strategy. You need to have a very, very strong edge. Hey Walter, welcome back. Yeah, you got here late. We start we start at 8:30, man. Did you sleep in? Tisk tisk. Hmm, what am, where am I getting a click? Where am I getting a click from? One thousand bit at 05. Okay. Well, I don't like that. No, I don't like that. We're kind of we're kind of in a choppy session. S and P five hundred has already started in. Oh, well, we've moved up a little bit. It looks like they're gonna go, and it stacked even more. I don't know that. Uh, yeah, it seems a little suspicious to me. Should be able to get my fill here. Looking into the micro yields, and I've wondered why volume was so low the last couple of days of March. Yeah, I, you know, it, I don't see any reason with wrong with, I don't see anything wrong with actively trading it up until the expiration day, but like, those last two or three days before they have to switch over to the next month, the volume definitely dies out. <laughs> Come on. So uh, it seems like they're scaring out a lot of contracts there, but there is a little bit of size at 07 half. So the market orders aren't just piling into it. Okay, cool. Okay, so now you can see I'm able to get my average position down to 04 now and my break even point is below the low of the day, right? That's what I like to see. So, dude, I'm I didn't get any feedback when I when I said that so so let, let me just try and say it one more time the the way that I average into contracts and things like that that is not necessarily an edge what that is is that is me um, manipulating the risk profile of my trade in a way that is is advantageous to me tactically but it doesn't actually change the long run expectancy of the strategy Okay. I am trying to swing it. Yes. I want I want to hold this position un, until at the very least after Wednesday's news. Right now if Wednesday's news comes out and the PMIs are higher than expected, I'm going to puke it. So that's the kind of play that I'm trying to to, to practice with. Because I think, well, I don't, I don't know how serious this is, but I think that the longer run goal here is to have a long short fund, and so I would, if you're going to have a long short fund, probably you're going to have to hold through news events sometimes, right? So how do I go about doing that, right? Well, yeah, I wouldn't be able to sleep if I were to do that. Well. The whole thing here is, is that it's it's pretty easy for me to relax at the moment, knowing that 
they would have to they would have to go all the way back to the other side of the range and bust through the lows in order to take out my in order to even take me to a loss right I'm still a little suspicious here because the flows kind of came in pretty aggressively like there was news or something was happening but I don't think that was actually the case I think that the market maker may may just be like playing it the other way and catching a bunch of people off sites and so i'm i'm a little skeptical about how much leg this actually has otherwise i wouldn't have just taken the fill right i would have moved it would have moved the fill up a little bit intraday cycle complete it it, it sure seems to me like if we're having a quiet day that what will happen is they'll go to the spot where everybody thinks that it's going to hold. They'll slam through that and then it comes back. Um, but it seems like the, the moment you decide that that's going to happen, it does something different. Right? like on this one it wasn't really clear what was going on until we were past 05 so if you really waited for the the flows to become clear they were getting an uptrend you could have gotten lung at 05 half 06 and been up four ticks now i guess four ticks is okay but you, you kind of see what you're leaving behind right You're, you're giving up four ticks, which is like a swing, right? So if you get in early, it's a big, big, big advantage to you, right? So in that situation, I I could just see where they were leaning. So I added a contract where they were leaning and then held through the heat. Ooh. So is it an edge? Well, when it works out, it's it's quite nice, right? Well, what if they had gone against me, right? Then I would be losing on two contracts, right? So that's why it doesn't change the long run expectancy of the strategy. There's all sorts of these little setups that people that like price action setups that people think, ah, oh, it tends to do X thing. And it's like, well, not really. Like if you, if you go and you back test it out, it's not so great. Hmm. Did they trade 09 here? They did. Okay. So I have a line at 10. I have short market maker position from the overnight session at 10. So that would be another place that I would maybe be looking to take some contracts off. Especially if I started to see a distribution up there. Well, I think I have to be pretty happy with how things have gone so far today, right? S&P 500 is on the sell side so far today. Mm, it's a decent amount. Yeah, about 7,000 contracts short. It's not, not too bad. I need to shave, man. It's, it's tickling my mouth here. It drives me crazy. You see me constantly going like this and playing with my face. <laughs> It kind of itches.
Hmm. Uh, trading floor audio. Trading volatility is the new reality for bond investors, says Bloomberg. Gauge of U.S. rates volatility reached the highest since 2008, and two-year treasuries are regularly seeing outsized moves. Bond investors are bracing for at least another year of rocky trading. Well, that could be good for us. Now, thinking about this from the perspective of the micros, should I have taken that in the micros? $15. Meh. Yeah. Because yesterday we were at 3.4. Now, I think that for my live account, it makes more sense to wait for the PMIs tomorrow. <laughs> Poopy and <laughs> me. Good morning. Okay, so in Utah. Oh, hold on. I hope that wasn't messing up the uh, the audio the whole time. I just fixed something. <laughs> okay, so in Utah, it, at 9th and 9th in Utah, there's this Wales this Wales culture. Okay, and it's like a roundabout. It's it's like a road that's been converted into a roundabout, and so it just seems really odd and out of place in the middle of this subdivision. There's this well, right? And um. And why would you have a whale in Utah, right? But um, locals have turned it into a joke and are worshiping the whale. And now people are saying that the whale is the reason why we got so much snow. Yeah, I just I think it's so silly <laughs> how people how people turn these things into a big deal. OK, well, I was really suspicious about that. Oh, five is like being a spoof. But somebody has come in and created a really strong I'm still not seeing distribution up in here. Like, I should be seeing it somewhere around here, but I'm not. Well, there was some at 10 half. Let's see how this goes. How many often do you see real spoofs? It's uh, certainly a lot less common, but I would still say that we see orders like that once a week, maybe. And yeah, it may be that you just don't notice them. So I have a control that is a part of my indicator suite that you can um, trial for two weeks at speculatorseth.com and afterwards it's hundred dollar one-time fee and it shows you when there is a significant change in the depth of market so you can see there that at 05 somebody added a thousand contracts right and it makes a little clicking sound when it happens so i notice them right away
Y... So sometimes when you get a really strong move like this, you'll come up to a distribution area and then there's a, like a little push where it tries to go a little bit further and then it settles. And that's usually not what happens like off of a first push. But if any of you don't have this and you get them, they are good. Thank you very much, Trading Bunny. I'm, I'm glad that you uh, found them useful. I have a lot of I have a lot of people what headphones I am using pioneer uh, I can't remember what they're called they don't even sell them anymore they're terrible don't count what is it called pioneer they're they're supposed to be their producer headphone oh um I need to, I I should put them I I should put all of my sounds in a zip file that's what I'll do Let, hold on a second <clears throat> so I've got tick oh wait it's not tick is maybe not mine yeah it's not not that one Rising, falling, flight, and chirp. Send to a compressed zip folder. Sounds.zip. Half a megabyte? Okay, that's acceptable. <laughs> oh, we're five minutes to the news. So just give me a second here. There you go. Use that link. Use that link and it will give you all the sounds that I've made. Is the jobs opening a mover? I I would... Okay, so... It isn't, is it? It isn't. This, so, what the deal is with this one, Walter, is it used to not be a huge deal. Um, you get a bunch of data points this week that help you kind of estimate what the non-farms are going to be although non-farms and is notoriously unpredictable okay but more effort gets put into that one than anything else and so the jobs openings is one of the metrics that people look at so it's always kind of had a little bit of an impact okay but then jerome powell said that they were looking at jobless claim or that they were looking at job openings and he talked about it in the press conferences and stuff like that. So when he did that, the market started paying a lot more attention to it. And the last couple of um, ones, they've paid a lot of attention to it, right? But in the last month, there's been a study basically saying that the number of job openings that are out there is like complete BS, right? 
so um it's it's a moderately sized thing i'm i'm not looking for anything too big but we should be aware that that the market does react to it so we can say the jobs opening is kind of like a pre-indicator of employer like yeah if you have a lot of jobs openings then there's probably a good chance that there's a lot of jobs added as well right so we get we get that number and then tomorrow we get adp which is like the non-farms but just from adp payment processor which is like the largest payment processor in the united states right and then there's the jobless claims that you get on thursday so all three of those things are kind of like tea leaves i would say that might help you just determine what they're going to do on friday and Estefa, where you been this morning? Okay, but the the other, I think the other thing that I was saying is is like more contextually important right now, right? So the market used to not pay too much attention to it, but then since Chairman Powell said something about it, they've paid a lot of attention to it. But we have reason to believe that those numbers are BS. So um, if we, we so number one, that makes it a little bit uncertain how much of a move we'll actually get off of it this time. And if we do get a move off of it, um, I, I wouldn't 100% trust it, right? I w I'm, I'm not just gonna be trying to go with it. Okay, but there are some other numbers coming out there, right? We're gonna have core durable goods and factory orders as well. Okay, market pulling big time. Okay, factory orders negative spot seven versus spot five. Core durable goods negative spot one versus zero. Durable goods revised one versus one. Negative one versus negative one. And the Jolts jobs opening less than expected at 9.931 million versus 10.5. Holy shit. Okay, well. I think that factory orders is probably a little bit more uh, bigger of a deal, but holy shit. Okay, so. Do you think I was just lucky? Well, I think to some extent there was a little bit of luck in there at me getting 04 and only having three ticks against me. Okay, but what did I tell you from the very beginning? The data that we had yesterday strongly suggests that the market is going into a recession. So I still need to see those service PMIs tomorrow. But if those service PMIs are weak as well, that makes this a great place to go along, I think. So what was I doing here today? I was, I was just kind of taking advantage of the inefficient nature of the market. <laughs> knowing that this is the thing that really matters, but that's not why they're trading right now. I don't know if I could, could make a better example for that sort of a trade. Man, I probably should have pulled out my my uh, micro account here and, and tried sweeping with that one. I really did not expect that to move us five basis points. Good grief. That was insane. Your Forex factory calendar does, yeah. Some I've always found that, that the Forex ca factory calendar in terms of looking at it for live information always fails me at key points. That's, um, so I get it through Financial Juice. So I have an affiliate link in the video description for Financial Juice. And if you're going to spend money in your trading, that's where I would go first. I think that's the most useful thing you can get. Um, you hear it over the news squawk and you see the number over on the sidebar. It updates immediately. Um, it will play a sound based on whether it's above or below if you choose. It's it's really valuable. <clears throat> yeah.
man. So where are we at? Yes, they did. 115.21 half was yesterday's high. So they, they busted through yesterday's high and kind of slowed down. So now other interesting thing. We had a pretty solid trend going up into that news that started about mm, 45 minutes before the news happened. So once again, just like we did yesterday, we have somebody pretty strongly front running the news in the treasuries. You think that they're going to continue doing that all week? Uh, so I, I guarantee you that the instant you start seeing, oh, somebody must know something ahead of the news and you start following that, you're going to get creamed. Hmm. But still, I, I can't help but notice. Yeah, this is this is good. So now I just let it run, right? Cuz now I've got like what? $600 $600 worth of buffer zone. So like if I want to hold it through non-farms, I probably can, right? If it were if we're still up here by Friday, I could hold it through non-farms, right? I don't know. I, I'm starting to feel like I have enough success with this so far. Mm, I mean, how long have I been doing it this way for? This kind of practice on the, the full treasuries. I don't know. I might I might be able to start taking start take more risk in the micros because we're talking about like what $50 I have to watch it a little bit but maybe the next time we do a move like this so we can try it on on live there's definitely a distribution there at 21 half but Two year down below 4% now too. Wow. Where were we early? Were we above 4%? Oh yeah, there we were. Oh no, not quite. The high was 3.9. 3.93. Nine, three. Still. That's almost 200 bucks in the two years. Maybe I should just go in on two years, man. Because some of these moves in the two year have been insane. This time it's a rev, so many running for the exit. Okay, so I just want to note, Nick Timrose tweets, the number of job openings ticked down to 9.9 .9 million in February, the lowest since May of 2021. The ratio of vacancies to unemployed workers fell to 1.67, the lowest since late 2021. So that is positive, but 
Um, and and I, it's not like a, a decline in that number is doesn't mean anything. Or you just remember that that number is kind of sus suspect. But we can still look at changes in the number. It's fine. But I think that it was probably also a combination of the goods orders and everything else. Iceberg order? I don't know. Um... <laughs> you ever think about doing trader interviews for the channel? I think you do a great job since you actually know how to clear the BS. Um, so I have, and there are a couple of people that I would like to try and interview. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't know if I really have the connections, you know? So, like, one of the things I've noticed, there's this kid. Uh, what is his name? I can't remember what his name was, but he was like a PhD in computer science, and then he started a podcast. And and I guess he was like friends with Elon Musk at one point or something like that. So he started his podcast, and he, he, he's gotten quite popular. I don't know how, because every clip that I've ever seen from him seems boring to me. And uh, But apparently he's, he's so big now that... Um, the Washington Post or whatever is has been attacking him for being anti woke. Okay, so so he's to that level. Okay, and he gets he gets the interviews with all of the big names, like the richest people in the world and stuff. How does he do that? This guy he comes out of nowhere and all all of a sudden he's interviewing Elon Musk and all these other big people, right? How do you do that? Where where is where is the network of rich people where I can ask them to be interviewed? Sort of a thing, right? I don't know. So so you get what I mean. I don't know how to approach that to to be successful with it because I don't I don't feel like I have those connections. So I'd like to do it, but I I'm, I'm looking for a piece of you know I'm looking for a piece of edge to make that one work. six degrees of bacon what ask the whale now this move they 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 just slipped through there another another little ways jeez i so so one of the things that's been happening to me this this week um is I have a, I, you know, like, I think I know which way it's going to go. Um, I'm not willing to put the risk on the live account. Um, I end up being right. But then when it moves, it moves so violently that I, I just can't get myself into a trade. Because, like, if I went short at 3.39, like, maybe they go down a lot more. But this is very likely to whip back in my face two basis points, you know? So I I really would need to be swinging it like over here in order to be playing right now. But that's okay. Um because I think that this all suggests that there's going to be plenty more opportunity for us. There is definitely some backwash on this thing, though. Something helped me with get a lot of training samples. Well, uh, yeah, we've got like five years worth of video. You can go back and watch if you want to watch the Dom. Yes. <laughs> What does that have to do with? I'm not quite sure I understand where that came from. Hotkeys, bro. <laughs> well, I, I didn't even have the account armed when that came through, man. I mean, I could have, you could have gotten 19, right? 19 is about the area you would have been able to play. 
uh, that would still would have been a pretty good trade. So the, the issue that I tend to have with this sort of thing is uh, uh, like, I'll be like, okay, this is the one that I can let run. I'll get long 19 and then it'll turn into a loss, you know, before like just going further the next day. Right. I'm not liking three, three, nine though. Let's read the Zero Hedge story on the factory orders. After January's headline factory orders tumbled month over month, consensus estimates are for February to see a further decline. However, February factory orders tumbled 0.7% month over month, and worse still, January was revised down to a 2.1% decline. That slows year-over-year -year growth in U.S. factory orders to just 2.7%, the slowest since February of 2021. Four factory orders were expected to be unchanged month over month in February, but declined spot 3% month over month. Four factory orders have basically gone nowhere for a year. Finally, what is going on here? The manufacturing PMI declining. Well, the new orders going up. Oh, that is suspicious. Outside of the COVID lockdowns, ISM manufacturing survey is in the deepest contraction since the great financial crisis, but manufacturers' orders are steady? Question mark. Hmm. That is, I'm not, I can't make sense of that. It's still going. Good grief. Now, it kind of looks like we might see 116 now. Okay. So now the interesting one over here is like, again, the S&P 500 had a bit of a sell on the morning, but now um, with this news it has moved up. But did you, did you notice that the treasuries had like really extreme volatility and the equities didn't? Well, so how do we explain that one? Well, there was, uh, how much volume was there in there? I don't know about that. Um, but, uh, so the, the thing that, that I'm going to be keeping an eye on is I don't think that this is good for equities, right? Like equities might be like, oh, yay, lower interest rates. We need buy all of the things, right? But if this hurts earnings, if we get a collapse in earnings, quote unquote, that's going to be like a 10, 20% decline in stocks from here, right? Seeing that news and the muted response in the equity market is is kind of a little bit of a red flag, don't you think? I'm thinking back on what has happened to this stream and um and it's like for those of you guys that are watching it's just it was like the perfect story, right? So coming in it's slow. Put laid the game plan out from the very beginning. Um had the theory and was a hundred percent right. Was I lucky? Maybe, maybe I was lucky on it. But um as an example of like being an informed trader, I, I don't think you can come up with a better one <laughs> Play, playing all of this correctly. Yeah, that's that's one of my best trades. I think. Because not only did I like I played both of these really well because I played it. This is the same position from yesterday, right? Played that one really well, too. 
and I played all of the like the little tactical bits well man it's not gonna give me I was like I don't like three three nine and now now I wish that we were three three nine because this volume is not stopping. We are now 20,000 contracts long. And I mean, this comes in on strong trend too. Like CTAs are probably going long here like mad. Seeing oil take a hit off of this, by the way. So, so I've been afraid to say this one, but I'm I'm gonna put it out there now. Over the weekend, we saw OPEC do a surprise oil cut, and everybody was really triggered, especially the Democrats, about the the output cuts and what this was going to do to oil prices and to inflation and meanwhile i'm sitting here going like well if if the economy is getting weaker then an oil output cut makes sense for for what opec does at least so you don't necessarily want to go long oil on that right if if the economy if we're about to go into a recession i don't think that you go long oil there I mean, maybe you make a little bit, but I, it doesn't seem like that's the right trade, right? It, if if we're going into a recession, the right trade is long treasuries all the way, right? Just saying. Okay, big, big spoof at three. They pulled it. Sorry, at 30. Jeez. Precious metals for the win. Well, gold looks awesome. I have a decent amount of silver. Well, I don't know. It used to be a decent amount of silver, and its silver's gone down so much. Let's see where it's at. Yeah, up 3% today. Still, it's still a long way to go to uh, overcome the loss that I've gotten in silver since I took that. I think that that particular commodity, that particular stock has been done not so well though. I really think this is going to go to 116, but it didn't give me a really a very good spot to get in. It did at 3.39. I wish I wish I had uh, mistakes were made. It's OK. So I'm going to come into silver here. Silver futures. Daily. We gotta go way, way back. Oh wow, okay, yeah. So we are we are still a good 50% from where they were in 2021. It's hard not to look at this in gold and silver now though and not like it, yeah. Meanwhile. Well, you're seeing copper. This is Freeport Mac Mac Moran, which the, their main thing that they make money off of is copper. Okay, uh, it, it, it's kind of been following 
gold and silver, but not as much and, and has been turning down, right? So, so what does that mean? Stagflationary environment, right? We're looking at an environment where, where interest rates maybe go lower, um, but inflation is still kind of a problem. Uh, so people want to get into silver and gold, but global growth sucks. And so copper is getting hit, right? So we can see the money coming out and going into some places, right? Seems like the money is coming. Oh, well, now the stocks are turning down. Okay. Yeah. See, you're seeing the money come out of equities and oil, and it's moving into treasuries and precious metals, right? It is definitely a good day in gold, though. That's that's a strong up move. That's what? Silver's up 3%. That's pretty good. Problem with Trump scare the investors? Mm. Are you suggesting that anything with Trump is infecting it investors right now? Well, you're getting 338 again. I don't know. I guess they did touch 116, but it kind of looks like this might be over. Nah, I think that the bonds and metals are moving up because the data suggests that we're going into a recession, right? Like, like the whole thing is, is we've gotten like this banking crisis and all this other stuff and everybody thought, oh, okay, like that's a big deal. And how does this affect the economy going forward and all of that sort of a stuff. And meanwhile, the data is saying that we were going to go into a recession anyways. We were going to go into a recession anyways. Regardless of anything else that's been happening the past three weeks. Right? That's why I think the treasuries are bidding so strongly. Is is that it's kind of like, oh. <laughs> Even after all of that, the economy was going to go into a recession on its own anyways. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that, that really changes your perspective, doesn't it? I don't know. I think that if I got 3.39, I might be able to justify taking a trade from there but I, this has come back far enough that they're probably going to start developing a range between 27 and 116 even ah okay when i see sharp v-shaped reversals what is going on there with meta order should there be some kind of decay at the end of the meta or not just a sharp reversal Okay, so yes, there is a decay. Um, note, first of all, let me pull on my little pen here. Remember that the decay looks like this. So the decay at the end of the meta order actually does look kind of sharp, right? But if it's a reversal, you're going to see something like this, right? So the question is, what is the cumulative delta doing? Which one of those two things does it look like? So let's come over here to the treasuries. And we'll look at the 10 year. And we'll look at the cumulative delta. Oops. Let me get bigger here. Okay, well. Do I see aggressive flow coming in against it? 
Not really. It's just kind of flattening out. So that is this. That's the... So they might be able to come back a little bit more. Now, here's another thing that we have to consider, though. Okay, and that is that there, the way that it... If you were to, to graph it, okay, like number of meta orders, impact, okay? At first, at first it appears linear, and then it kind of flattens out like this, right? But then if it's large enough, it it shoots out like that, okay? And at this point, the market becomes unhinged, okay? This is the kind of situation where we have to be concerned about that sort of a thing. So um, this is not one large player really cleverly accumulating contracts. That was, this was, look at this. Look at this one right here, man. Ooh. That was that and, and and by the way, no, where was the biggest amount of volume was right here. Okay. So so that means he so from what 9500 to uh, 105. So about 10,000 contracts and half of it traded towards the end. So that means that on their own Grand Chris, they were doing the risk, uh, the risky way. They, they were saying that they have high risk tolerance, right? They Because they, they did slow and then gobble a whole bunch up at the end, right? This was, this was a meta order. They knew or they, they had something that told them that this was likely to push really aggressively higher. Or that th that the news is going to be bad. Quite amazing, right? So not not every day that you're going to see one that cl that clear. Um, them front running news like that so aggressively is is uh, and this is the second day in a row that they've done this now too. That's really something else. I don't understand what what you mean, Walter. By kind of probes the point of the yield curves. They sure got back down here, up here quickly, though, didn't they? So if this move is no longer an organized sort of a thing, we kind of have to be a little bit more careful, right? What possible chance can anyone have when you're up against informed traders front running? Well, that's that's. That's the whole thing that I'm trying to get you guys to realize, right? If you're not the one that's informed, probably you shouldn't be trading, right? That doesn't mean that you that you will always be the uninformed one, right? There can be narrow situations where you know something that's not being priced into the market. That happens all the time. In fact, I would argue that the news that we had yesterday, but well, it was not being properly factored in by the market. The news that we had yesterday really strongly suggests that that we're moving into a recession. Uh, it really strongly suggests that the next couple of data points are going to be weak, right? So we had that initial move, but that was as far as the, the market can move, right? Because of the square root lot, unless it's going to like really go nutso, they can only move so far up, right? And then you get the overnight action that takes over, which is just kind of like a wash. Like that movement doesn't necessarily matter. Like it moves, but it's not because of something fundamental in the economy. It's because people just need to trade or the market maker does their thing or whatever, right? So then that provides us an opportunity to get in again on that same piece of information that or we're going into a recession and that rates are gonna go lower, right? So there, then I have an opportunity to be the informed trader right because because here's the thing for all we know that guy that front run front front ran this thing doesn't really know a whole lot more than you do it's possible i i'm betting that they've probably looking at their metrics and have a bunch of information that suggests what their prediction of what the number is going to be and everything but it's possible that they didn't know anything more than you did right because we did know enough to have made that trade. Hey, NASDAQ Technologies, what, what you been up to? 
Had a pretty big move today. Nah, we're doing okay. I need to shave and it's driving me crazy. What do you do when you're growing the beard out and, and it starts poking into your mouth? Because it drives me freaking crazy. I guess I need to get pomade to... Right. Push it the right direction. Because I do kind of I do kind of like the little bit of gray in here. I think it looks nice. Okay, well. Ah, once a meta order goes through, how do they manage their position when price retraces against their position? That's a good question, because I don't entirely know. I know that they do that. So I remember being show, uh, them talking about like there are people that will watch the trade overnight or like they'll have people in Asia, for instance, that will watch the trade. And those people don't necessarily have to do a whole lot, but they have somebody like babysitting the position. Um, I, I think that they do kind of continue to market make and do so in a way that uh, makes it easier for it to move in their direction. Um, but ultimately, on a trade like that, in order for you to make money, somebody else is gonna have somebody else is gonna have to come in and buy big after you, right? So I, I'm, I'm gonna tell you a little secret here and and you watch the news and you'll find out that this actually happens this way almost all the time, okay? You'll see this all the time, right? So if you have a meta order, okay, you bought, it comes back here like this, okay? If somebody, if you were to sell it immediately, then you would lose money on the position, right? So you need somebody else to come in and buy it here, right? Okay, so now, now you have the opportunity to to sell it right and and make x much right okay what if we do it three okay now you're really making money right so what you will often find happen is a hedge fund they've made money off of a trade like this when they got um by the time you're seeing them on cnbc talking about it it's because they've already had two moves in their favor does that make sense they've already had one to two moves in their favor off of the position already and they're publicizing it in the hopes that even more people get in it so that they can get out happens all the effing time it's so usually when you start to see a hedge fund bragging about a trade it, it's it's already gone their way like two or three moves if we have high inflation and recession at the same time banks are going to fail well i i am not so sure about how much inflation we're actually going to have here so so i think that what's going to happen is we're going to get to where um, inflation is below 2%, but not below zero, right? So, so what that means is interest rates probably still decline, but that the Federal Reserve might not necessarily need to like print a ton of money and drop interest rates to zero and all of that sort of stuff to provide the stimulus. And and probably they won't be able to because you're not getting like deflation. You get what I mean? That's that's what it seems to me is happening. It does look stagflationary. It does look stagflationary, but the, the market is saying that interest rates are gonna decline, right? I wouldn't listen to Peter Schiff. He he doesn't. He's not good at this. <laughs> just 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 honestly, 
he he gets a lot of screen time and everything but like you're talking about a guy that's basically been sitting in gold for like 15 years now and had it going gone nowhere right and he just keeps predicting the same old thing i wouldn't i wouldn't look at him for your short-term trading uh tactical trading <laughs> we the pros only listen to the mad money opinion well you get you have to provide your own opinion i i find that mad money is that show or not not mad money Ugh. mad money is a different is a different beast the fast money show on cnbc you'll learn a lot from watching that show i i think one of the the problems that you're going to run into is that there are a lot of sources out there that provide very good information but they do not have the proper framework to correctly interpret all of this information because there are still very few people out there that are uh, analyzing the market from an order flow position okay so so one person that i think you can just you can just take what they say and and just just straight up take their analysis for for what it is and and of course you will still put your own own feeling on top of it but mark flood from goldman sachs that guy knows his shit okay and he has been extremely effective at predicting the flows well in advance for the month right now he's using more seasonality mark flood flood so if you're on if you see zero hedge and you see them talk about him you want to read those ones yeah um now you're gonna want because what could happen is is he'll say okay the flows look positive but then you have another piece of news that says okay but this report is going to be bad right now you have a situation where it could contradict what he's going to say but that's that's a, a bit that what he's looking at is the flows right and so because he has that correct framework what he says is a lot more useful whereas if you're watching fast money right they're they're giving you good information they're saying okay market moved it was probably because of this um this thing's probably going to happen etc cetera, etc cetera. but they're not looking at it from the flow perspective they're they're probably looking at it more from the fundamental perspective so you're going to have to take that information that they're giving and put it within the order flow um theory of markets perspective instead right uh maybe it was john flood yeah you're right it's it's john flood No, 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 it's it's John Flood. So let me read you one. This is this is a premium article from two days ago. Okay. In his chart of the day published over the weekend, Goldman Flow trader John Flood writes that Fed fund futures suggest an imminent end to the Fed's current hiking cycle. What does this mean for risk assets? According to Flood, U.S. equities have generally rallied in the months following the end of past tightening cycles. In the three months following the peak Fed funds rate, the S&P 500 has returned an average of 8%, ranging from 14% to negative 1% and rising in five of six episodes. On a 12-month basis, the S&P 500 has returned an average of 19%, rising in five of six episodes and rallying more than 10% in each of those. As of Friday's close, the market is pricing in more than two rate cuts before the year end. It was blah, 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 blah. Okay. Meanwhile, Morgan Stanley. Morgan Stanley Chief cross at asset strategist Andrew Sheets said that they should be careful what they wish for if what they are wishing for is weaker growth that pushes the Fed to ease and cut rates because the historical evidence is less supportive than appreciated. 
In August 1989, January 2001, September 2007, and February 2022, the Federal Reserve was easing policy as growth weekend. All were very bad times to sell high-grade bonds and buy equities. Okay, so this is the, the current argument in the market, right? Um, but but flood he's just looking at the orders and he's saying okay yeah once they once they stop hiking the equity markets tend tend to go up i would i would argue that the trade is long treasuries <laughs> and not long stocks but we'll see which 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 side of that actually ends up going at the moment you can see equity markets not liking it right there was another one where he said that it looked like Oh, come on. Um, uh, I need the tools here. Past week. Uh, there's been more than that. The past month. <laughs> well anyways the the uh, any any kind of analyst that you see that's like low analysts those are the ones you really want to listen to silver is slightly stronger moving up Imagine hyperinflation combined with high rate. Well, central banks can't go bankrupt, but it would be absolutely, it would be absolute chaos for the banking system, wouldn't it? Yeah, Peter doesn't vacillate in opinions. That's the problem. P Peter, Peter is. This is all going to end in hyperinflation, and this is all going to be awful. And he's been saying that for 15 years. So, his most of the time, his his what he's saying has not been really relevant or helpful. He's he's not saying what he's saying from a really solid fundamental analysis of the flows that are going to help you in determining what the flows are going to be for the next day, week, month, year. He's he's economics for politics sake, right? He's 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 only in economics in as a, in as much as it can bolster his political position. You, you got to be careful about the guys that okay like like another example somebody that i wouldn't pay attention to Krugman. oh man that guy don't just ignore him i mean you, you might post interesting stuff and everything but like if he makes a prediction i just ignore him just ignore him because he's a political hack Now there's another one. I I, you, well, I mentioned Mad Money. Mad Money is a different issue. So the the issue with Mad Money is that he is so popular, and the flows that he creates within these stocks make it difficult to make money from them. So the play I think over there is watch his show, learn how he values companies, do your own research, find your own companies. And then eventually he will end up talking about your stock and it will make your stock explode and then you can sell, <laughs> right? That's that's the way you play that one. So my wife left a hairpin on my desk here and I was just playing with it and accidentally flicked it and I don't know where it went. So now it is forever lost in this room, I think. I found it. You know what? I need to just take this out of this room because she's trying to mark her territory and this is not her territory.
His funds are now... Uh, so let's see here. Can we look that up? What is his name? What is his fund? Euro Pacific Asset Management. Okay, so he has an emerging markets, gold, international bond, international dividend, and international value fund. So you might be able to say that international value has done better this year. I guess you could take it from their, that perspective, but I don't know if that would be... I mean, that would just be over the last year, like... Oh man, 3.6 now? Jeez. It's not stopping, is it? I I really have a hard time if you miss the, the wow. And look, no volume traded through here on the micros. I have a really hard time trying to, you know, when you miss the initial move, man, trying to jump on board. I really, I really should have way, way back here, right? Maybe even at 3.4, I could have done it. And that would have been a, a respectable trade. So I really was way too timid. But like the further on this goes, the, the less and less sense it makes, right? Well, let's put it this way for, for Peter Schiff. Um, his fund is EPGIX. Oh, uh, that won't, won't let me see it. It must, it must not be, a, it must be a open end fund. Okay, so like here's gold this year looks good. But when you look at gold, like since he's been talking about it, if it will do it. Oh, well, not let me see further than 2016. Uh, it was, it was, there was a whole period from about 2008 until 2020, basically, where gold just looked awful. <laughs> But you notice that it, it's more like, well, these are the assets that I like, so I'm running a fund in them. I don't know if you could really use that to brag that his um, analysis has been more effective. Kind of watching this to see... I think that this 31 will probably limit their upside here, but we may just be in like a full trend on all day. Like I said, sometimes the market can become unhinged and when it's no longer like organized meta orders and it's just, just people scrambling to buy that, that just, that sort of thing just trends all day, right? Increase the candle size. Why? On what? On my S and P five hundred chart. Why? Then you can't see anything. Where did all that? 
social welfare where did all that juice that the fed well we're still higher than when we started this whole thing right Mm, I don't have a gold chart over here. It does look like gold is doing a pullback now. Mm, I don't think that it's accurate to say that gold is the thing that measures everything. Okay, there's there's no thing that measures everything, right? All things are relative to itself. Gold is something that is relatively useful to look at versus other things, but it doesn't tell you everything. I it it, it won't let me see data before 2016, unfortunately, because I was I had weekly bars. So I'd love to maybe if there's an, maybe I could do it on an ETF, maybe. Corporation, maybe. Oh, that lets me see. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so here you go. Right. So Peter Shift and all all his buddies were all super pro gold for a long time, right? And then it went, Bleh. and now and now you're getting kind of like it's going. Like I think gold could be the place this next year. Don't get me wrong, but I'm not. I'm not necessarily interested in what Peter Schiff thinks about the economy because he was wrong wrong for so long, right? Even a blind mouse catches a cookie every once in a while. If you had to peg the dollar to something, what would I would refuse to peg it. <laughs> I would refuse to peg it. So. I mean, I mean, I guess if you insisted on doing it as a peg, you'd want some sort of basket of commodities, right? I I feel like people don't understand. Like, ooh. blockchain commodity. It, you need the ability to modify the monetary supply like that's the whole point is in in order to have an economy as large as ours the ability to modify the monetary supply based on current conditions is essential right the united states would not have been able to grow as large as it has if its currency was still 100 percent tied to gold like it was 100 200 years ago You got you got to realize, like there has to be debt, right? Why does there have to be debt? Because what people want to do always exceeds our current resources, right? It's just like you want to live in a house that's oh, it's always going to be more than the amount of money you have in the bank for most people, right? So you have to have debt. And we as a society, the things that we want to do as a society is always going to be more than like the current current assets that are already out there. So you as a society have to have the ability to take on debt, too. So how do you do that? You do it through having a fiat currency. Right. I mean, are you really benefiting from it though, Keller? Are you are you profitable on the position yet?
You are profitable now. Because, like, look at this, man. Barely, but yes. The now, it sounds like now is a great time to exit. <laughs> Even in the 1900s, gold standard wasn't 100% pegged with full reserves. So I, I don't know a whole lot about the history of that, but but I would say that yes, that at least in, in, like there's always been debt and so forth. And at least in our current system, it's done out in the open and there's like control and there's, you know, a federal reserve board and it's it's built into the government laws and, and all of this sort of stuff, right? It's just... I don't know, man. I think that uh, there are some people that want Doge to go to a dollar, right? I still don't think it's ever going to happen. And the longer out we go, the more difficult it is for this thing to, to go up, right? So, I honestly, if you've held it since 2021 for two years... And you've made, let's say that you got in at 05, and you are now at 10. So you doubled your money in two years. So you made 50% per year. I guess that's not bad. I guess that's not bad. Most people did not make money, though, right? 90% of y'all's underwater. I wouldn't necessarily brag about that one. I, I feel kind of like, there you go, that's right. <laughs> I mean, if it goes to a dollar, because so you know, remember like the Dogecoin millionaire? Like, he, I don't think he ever sold. I think he still thinks it's going to go to a dollar. I don't think that guy has a clue what he's doing. But I tell you what, um, I I think that the longer this goes on with Elon Musk, the less and less influence it'll have. So I, there might be a little bit more in this, but. That's not the sort of, sort of thing that I would want my money, you know, right? Cause, Cause if you're long at this point, if you're long, if you're staying long in Dogecoin, then the prediction that you're making is that Elon Musk will continue to promote it and that will bring in more orders. Fiat money is given to useless stuff like crypto and centralized economy. Um, so, I mean, that's not true though, right? We have had GDP growth in the last two years, right? If you put all of that money in and you didn't have any GDP growth, then it would be a problem. Right? <laughs> um, I would I would say though that uh, some stimulus money, at least the way that we've done some of this stimulus, we're not really getting very much for our money's worth, right? Like the drag that it's creating on growth compared to what it's what it's spurring, we we just don't get the growth that we used to you know this is such a monster hey guys i gotta go i'll see you tomorrow stay excellent team